You know, when I was in graduate school, I lived with a guy called David Carlton, who sends his regards, another student of Barry's, and um, I, you know, I was reminiscing about a night that, I think the only night that we had Barry over for dinner, and David, uh, like Manjo, was a Sanskritist as well as being a mathematician. He had spent a year in Sri Lanka, and um, he liked to cook really spicy Indian food, and so he made this gigantic dish of chicken vindaloo, which is one of the spiciest things that I've ever eaten, and we've heard so much about Barry's graciousness in every situation, even in the situation of maximal extremity. And this, I think, beyond any mathematical interaction we ever had, I think this is what it was maximally displayed as Barry was sitting there at our table, visibly sweating and in great pain, and his face getting redder and redder as he politely continued to eat the food that, uh, that we had made. Um, and it was, uh, and uh, the, reason I, the reason I tell this story, besides just to sort of add uh, one more example of Barry's graces, is to, is to say that that, uh, that very night, Barry wrote me an email uh, titled, uh, That Wonderful Dinner and Some Math, uh, in which he wrote about, well, what I had been thinking about at the time was, you know, it was, it was the 90s, for those of many of us who remember the 90s, and it was the time uh, of excitement about Fermat, the new developments, and the modular method, and I, like a lot of people, was thinking about uh, generalized Fermat equations, right? What happens when you have ternary equations that look like Fermat with different exponents, like uh, a to the p plus b to the q uh, plus c to the r equals zero. And the subject of this email that Barry wrote me, quite possibly still in a kind of fevered and sweaty state from, uh, from this food we had eaten, um, was that you can really think of this just as the Fermat equation with p, p, and b. I mean, with his study of points on some higher genus curve. As Barry pointed out, this, although it looks like an affine surface, is in some sense a curve too, because there's an action of GM uh, on, the, on the solution, on the set of solutions to this equation. Um, but it's weighted, right? Let's see if I can write this down correctly. So GM acts on this affine surface in, in three space. Um, all right, well, that kind of, I guess it sends it out, I could maybe even send it to uh, lambda, send it to lambda the QRA, lambda to the PR, B, lambda to the PQ, C, right? And the point is that the quotient of this surface by this action of GM, well, the quotient of a surface by a one-dimensional group should be a curve, except it's not quite a curve. Where there's something funny, in the case where all the exponents are the same, it's really just a standard story where what I've written down is a GM bundle over an honest curve, and we're studying points in that curve. But here, um, something else is going on because there's some stabilizers in this action. So uh, Barry in his email did not use the word stat. You call this a magnified curve. And I'm, I'm not sure whether it was because you were trying not to intimidate me <laughs> or because you yourself preferred uh, not to use this language. So maybe. Uh, Part of the uh, part of the uh, of the lesson is that sort of it's now 20 years later. It's 2018 instead of 1997, and uh, we're sort of in a world where people are sort of like more at ease with calling a stack a stack. And so I want to sort of just sort of uh, say a little bit about rational points on stacks, even though we were afraid to call it by its name at the time. So let me sort of say the motivation uh, for why one might want to do this. So here's a. Uh, let me talk about two popular conjectures uh, in number theory, in, the area, in an area that's sometimes uh, called arithmetic statistics. So let me start with counting number fields, and I'll give a very abbreviated story about an area that a lot of people in this room have, have worked in. So yeah. Ah, so I mean, the question is, what does one actually mean by a solution to this equation? Does one, so maybe, maybe one sort of, in order to get a reasonable answer, right? I mean, you may want to say, hmm, I want integral solutions that are co-prime or something like this. But the reason you find yourself wanting to say that is you're sort of, uh, it, 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 it amounts to the same thing as integral point on this so-called magnified curve. Um, but I don't want to talk about those curves. I don't want to talk about um, okay, so here's a, a fundamental question. So um, you can say, okay, uh, 
How many number fields are there? OK, there's a lot. So let's say a little bit more. Um, and I'm going to sort of decorate this uh, sentence for a long time. So if you're taking notes, don't, maybe don't write it down yet. Um, let's say of degree d over q. OK, still a lot, right? There are a lot of quadratic fields. Um, but let's say now, and discriminant bounded by x. And now already we're down to a finite set, right? Where the discriminant, I'm always going to be the norm of the discriminant, the absolute value of the discriminant. So now already, if I fix the degree and I put an upper bound on the discriminant, um, we're going to have some finite set of number fields by a rather old result of Hermite. Um, and given a finite set, we should, of course, ask it its size. It's the only thing that we can ask. Um, and in particular, we can ask how this behaves as a function of x. Let me even decorate this a little more, OK? So first of all, um, let's be grown-ups and not restrict ourselves to the field Q. <laughs> let's just have some arbitrary global field here. But if you want to think, for at least some of this talk, you can pretend it's Q. There will be other times when I want you not to do that. So let's say K, uh, Clea, K, a global field. So now, series, now, so now this discriminant certainly means like the norm of the discriminant down to my uh, down to my global field. Um, and now this might not be a number field anymore, but because k, of course, might be the function field of a curve over a finite field. Um, and maybe let me put in one more condition. Uh, even though I've already gotten myself down to a finite set here, uh, I might want to say, and Galilog in G contained in the symmetric group on, on D letters. Okay, so this is a slight abuse of notation because I don't mean to necessarily say that these fields are Galois. I just mean to say uh, a degree D extension, right? It's Galois closure will have some Galois group, which is a subgroup of the symmetric group on D letters, and I may wish to refine my count by that. Okay, so now I think I've decorated the sentence enough to have this be the most uh, refined form of the question that I want to address. So we can call this, uh, so we can call this number Um, let's call it n sub g of x over k. So the, the d is now absorbed into the g, right? The g is a permutation group on, on d letters. Um, say again? Ah, so how does this look in the function of case? Let me draw a picture of it. I mean, I, I could just say the discriminant is the discriminant. It's like when we sort of set a, you know, like that? <laughs> well, it's a, it's a divisor on the curve, and that has a norm. What? Well, okay, so let me, let me draw this picture, okay? So here's, we all agree that's a curve, and we, we all agree this is a more complicated curve, okay? So, uh, so k is going to be the function field of this curve. L is going to be the function field of this curve. And then in this cover, there's some ramification, right? So there's a ramification divisor. Uh, downstairs. Um, and then um, I just mean, uh, if you like, the degree of that divisor. Um, or maybe that times log q if we're really going to be uh, a, a precise by getting an actual real number. Um, but so as, as in the number field case, it's measuring the ramification in this map. And if this map happened to be completely unramified, then that would be one. Or I guess I'm using log coordinates, so I guess it would be zero. Um, Okay. Oh, am I not supposed to do this? Am I supposed to use these buttons or something? Yeah. No. Where, where, where are they? Over here? No. Oh, no. Right here. Right here. Okay. In the middle. Stop. Stop. <laughs> Down. <laughs> can I just get the canvas right on this? Oh, I see them. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but I was always like sitting in the back, like doodling in my notebook. I was never up here before. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, oh, I was in, I was in the middle of a sentence actually when I did that, um, and asked how this behaves because this is going to come back up, and you're going to want to see what I wrote here. Um, how, how does this behave as a function of x? We're certainly not going to have an exact formula for this, but we can ask about asymptotics. So uh, this is 
uh, we have a conjecture that is completely supposed to tell the story for this, originally due to Mala, so I'll write down uh, roughly what this says. So conjecture um, due to Mala, and maybe I'll write this sort of a strong form in the weak form, so let me write the strong form. Um, it's that um, this function, if I count number fields, um, is asymptotic to um, some constant, depending on g times k, uh, times x to some power, depending on g, times log x uh, to some power, depending on g and k. And maybe I should say that it's, the conjecture is not just that there's some constants making this true and the function has this form. The conjecture specifies specific values of a and b. Um, and maybe I'll write down what the a is. So um, a equals um, the 1 over the minimal index of an element of, um, of G. OK, so what is the index of an element? I don't mean index. I mean, I don't mean like index like the group it generates in the group. I mean index in the sense of every element of G is a permutation. And the index is n minus number of orbits. Uh, sorry, D is what I'm using for my. So for instance, what would it be, what would A be if, um, if I had the symmetric group on D letters? Like if the Galois group were the full symmetric group, which in some sense is supposed to be the generic case, right? So E.g., if G equals SD, um, then, uh, well, then, which element of the symmetric group has the most orbits is just a transposition, right? Which has, n, which has d minus 1 orbits. And so the index is d minus d minus 1, which is 1. So, um, so a. Oh, yeah, sorry. Good. Uh, a non trivial element. Uh, by, by comparison, if, uh, if g were, let's say, the alternating group, then you don't have a transposition, right? But you do have a three cycle. That is n minus 2 orbits, so you get 1 half. So if g equals ad, then a of g is 1 half. Um, and maybe since I've written this, I might as well say uh, b equals the number of such uh, conjugacy classes of elements minus 1. So actually, in, um, in this case, there's a unique conjugacy class of transpositions, so this b, this log factor doesn't arise. So in particular, what this predicts is that if I count the number of SD extensions of, let's say, Q bound to the discriminant of discriminant less than x, the number of those is actually asymptotic to x, like x to the 1. And uh, yeah, Daniel. Oh, you're right. So this is why I didn't want to say it. Okay, so you have to, it's really like up to the, a sort of cyclotomic action depending on how many roots of unity are in K. So I already said something that wasn't quite true. Um, okay, but I don't feel like remembering exactly what to write. Up to something. Okay. Um, so, um, Okay, so e.g., um, this tells us that uh, the number of extensions with Galois group SD should be asymptotic to some constant um, times x. And that's indeed known to be true now for, um, well, for d equals 2, this is kind of, if you've never thought about this question before, then it's kind of a fun exercise to think about why this is true for quadratic extensions. Uh, for quadratic extensions of 2, you're essentially, those are in bijection with square free integers, and so you're just trying to convince yourself that there are about x square free integers less than x, which is actually not a complete triviality, but it is true. Um, for 3, this is a theorem of Davenport and Heilbronn from the 70s, and then for 4 and, for four and 5, uh, this is, of course, uh, the results of, of many people, including Manjul and his collaborators, which sort of invigorated thinking about this question. Um, Maybe I'll say one more thing to make this plausible, which is that I'll just say it in words. Why should this be true? Why should there be about root x 
extensions with Galois group AD. So just to make it seem like this isn't totally crazy, um, why should there be um, about root x extensions with Galois group AD? Well, having Galois group the alternating group, that's equivalent to having your discriminant be a square. So you're really just saying, if I think there's about x extensions with discriminant up to x, and then I say, oh, but I only want to consider those whose discriminant is a perfect square, there's square root of x such discriminant, so if I believe there's an average of one field per discriminant, maybe this is somewhat reasonable. Um, but this we don't know even for A4. And actually, fun group theory exercise, for A4, actually, you get two conjugacy classes of three cycles, and so it's uh, supposed to be root x log x. But that seems completely out of reach, and A4 is a pretty small, solvable group. Um, so, um, having made this big point about the log factor, let me just comment that mostly today I want to talk about the weak form, which is just that asymptotically uh, x to the a is less than this count, is less than x to the a plus some unspecified epsilon. I'm just going to worry about the exponent of x here. What did I write? Oh, yeah, I want x. Good. Uh, yeah, Hector. Yeah, so what can you say about the constant that's supposed to show up in the asymptotic? Oh, this constant? Yes. Yeah. It's a bit subtle. So for S, for the symmetric group, module has a prediction, which I think is a pretty good one, which I believe in is true for D up through 5, and he makes a prediction uh, for all D. Um, I think in general, you can imitate. Uh, you can imitate the heuristic that Manjul uses to get that for other groups, but I don't think it's right for all groups. This is something that, um, that Akshay and I thought about a bit. And then um, Simon wrote a paper about this, right, for A5. So actually, a student, Simon Rubenstein Salzano, wrote a, uh, a, a paper about this in the A5 case, where there are kind of extra rational factors that occur. And to be honest, I think I still find them a little bit mysterious and don't quite know what they are. Um, it's also the case, I mean, I'm, I'm going a bit far afield, but. Um, We'll see that it certainly depends on how you count, and one of the themes as we go is going to be that there's different ways in which you can count number fields, and, that, and the behavior of that constant might, uh, might depend on them in a very serious way. So for instance, for D4, there's an old theorem of Henri Cohen and Diaz and Diaz and Olivier, um, and they show the model's conjecture is true in that case, and the constant, you're excited for the constant to be some like nice Euler product, and like, no way, it's like nasty. It's like some kind of like double Dirichlet nonsense, which is like a big sum of, I mean, I'm sorry for the double Dirichlet people, it's all still here. It's, uh, um, no, I mean, they, they compute it, but it's not, it's not as beautiful as you might expect, so. Um, okay, is that an okay answer for that question? Okay. Um, but as you're gonna see, since I'm even afraid to talk about the log factor in this talk, I'm definitely like 100 times as afraid to talk about the constants, so I'm mostly gonna talk about the exponent. Um, okay, so often I give like whole talks about that problem, but I'm not gonna do that uh, today. Let me quickly uh, transfer to another popular conjecture that we study, which is the following, okay? So, um, so question two. Um, How many points are there? Um, let's say over Q, except now I'm going to immediately change this to K, but you can still think it's Q. Um, on uh, a projective variety, V. Um, and now, of course, as we know very well, depending on the variety, there might be very few or there might be a lot. For the moment, I want to think about the case where this variety is very close to being rational, where it's a so-called Fano variety whose canonical bundle uh, is anti-ample. So in the kind of great trichotomy uh, of, of curves, for instance, this would be like the genus zero case where there's infinitely many points. Um, so let's put in here uh, Fano so that my, uh, but then of course I have a question where the answer is probably going to be infinite. So in order to get a better question, let me say, of height, at most x. OK, so what does height mean? Well, this is a projective variety, so these points are sitting inside projective space. Let me take k equals q for a minute and say, what does height mean? Oh, I did it again. 
Oh, there they are. Okay. So, so height of a point a naught through a n in p and q. By this, I just mean the maximum absolute value of these n plus one integers. But now, of course, remembering that because these coordinates are only well defined at the scaling, I have to scale so that they become co-prime integers. So having done that and writing the uh, rational point of its usual uh, reduced form, uh, this is what I mean by height. And then it's completely clear, in a way that is maybe not quite as clear in the number field counting case, that I mean there are only finitely many points of projective space of height at most x. I mean, I'm just letting these coordinates range from negative x to x. Um, and so in particular, only finitely many of them are on this variety, whatever it may be, and we can ask how many. OK, here too, there is a popular conjecture that lots of people believe. Um, and it looks like this. This is the conjecture of Batir of Imani. And here I have to be a little bit careful about something. Um, let's say, um, There is an open subvariety, uh, open dense. Since somebody before complained that I didn't say non trivial for a group element, let me also say that I mean a non empty uh, open subvariety. Uh, there is an open dense subvariety U of V such that um, if I count, well, I guess I didn't give this a name, so let's call this uh, N sub V of X, comma K such that n sub u of x comma k. So I'm not quite counting all the points on v. I'm only counting the point on this, on this open subvariety. But that should be, it should be OK to throw out some closed subvariety, I feel. Um, is asymptotic to some constant, depending on v and k, uh, times x to some constant, depending on v, uh, times log x to some constant, uh, depending on on v and k. Um, and again, these constants are the terrible money, like tell you what they're supposed to be. It's not just a statement about the form of the asymptotic, it's a, it's a precise prediction, which again I won't uh, I won't write down for you. Um, so this looks somewhat familiar. Um, I mean, what do these two conjectures have in common? Well, one thing, just I, I mean I feel I, I must confess, one thing these conjectures have in common is that neither of them is true. Um, they both have counterexamples that have been found over the years. Um, but um, but the, the counterexamples have to do with the delicacy of getting this power of log right. So there are examples where we know that the power of log is not quite right. Um, so let's we're going to concentrate for today on the sort of weak forms of these conjectures, which I think are quite likely to be OK. So similarly with Batir and Manin, we could say we're just going to worry about the exponent of x and not worry so much about what the, uh, what the log factor is. Um, still, one can ask, why do these two conjectures have such similar forms? And there's a few reasons it could be, right? I mean, like one is that there's just not that many functions in the world. And maybe if you're studying the asymptotics or something, like, you know, what's it going to be except the power of x times the power of log? That's a somewhat unsatisfying answer, which could be correct for all we know. Um, it could also be that both of these problems we might discover are sort of somehow governed by uh, some kind of L function that has a continuation and we're sort of going to use some Tiberian theorem and like, read off this power of x and the power of log from maybe like uh, um, the, uh, the location of some pole of some L function and its, and its order. Um, that's probably not really true, though. I mean, I think that these, and it's true for very special examples, you know, varieties that are like homogeneous spaces. You can really, I mean, the cases where this conjecture has been proven are often varieties with very large group actions where you really can draw the connection uh, between the rational points and the variety. Um, you can make a sort of zeta function out of them that actually has good analytic properties, and then you find that you actually are uh, finding the rightmost pole and the uh, and the, order, the degree of the pole of some L function, and that's what's giving you your power of x and power of log. But in general, I think these problems are sort of too floppy to be described in that way. So uh, what the, the story I want to tell today, and this is, maybe I'll say that everything I'm going to say. Oh. What? <laughs> OK, OK. Um, 
So everything I want to say today uh, is joined with David Zurich Brown and uh, with, with Matt Satriano. Let me write him above because he's alphabetically first. And David Zurich Brown um, is to try to express a sense in which these two conjectures are really uh, species of one more general conjecture that can be interpolated between these two. Um, and the challenge you face when trying to do that is that they seem to be about different things, right? One is about counting, they're both about counting, but one is about counting field extensions, uh, and one is about counting solutions to some equation, rational right? functions of some variety. So I think somebody mentioned earlier that sort of one of the aspects of working with various, he sort of trains you to do number theory like a topologist. So what does that mean in this case? It means that it's a, if you are a topologist, it's not at all strange to think of the set of G covers of something as maps of that space to a certain thing. And what that certain thing is, it's the classifying space of G, whatever that may be. So let's just say, um, so how can, these, how can these two problems, two problems uh, be unified? Um, and the answer is by means of the observation that a G cover of a field K is a K point on BG. Now, now what is BG? I mean, what kind of thing is it? Um, well, it's not a scheme anymore. It's an algebraic stack. So um, let me sort of draw the topologist's picture. I'll just sort of take one board uh, to do this. So uh, so what is BG? I mean, I think the picture from topology that we're all very familiar with, um, or, or can be made familiar with at one board, is that, um, so OK, everything from here on, it's like not algebraic geometry at all. It's just a good picture to draw to give you the idea if you haven't thought about classifying spaces before. Um, for instance, the classifying space um, of Z is just a circle. How do maps, how, so how does this work? I mean, I seem to be saying that if I have um, some space, uh, let's call it uh, S, um, the, the thing about a circle is the circle certainly has a nice Z cover, namely it's covered by R. So if I have anything, any map to the circle gives me a Z cover of S just by pullback. And the fact that this cover is actually contractible makes it be the case that actually Z covers of S are just a bijection with homotopy classes of maps from S to S1. That's sort of what it means to be a classifying space. It means I can take this project, if for some reason I wanted to sort of study uh, Z covers of S, I could do so by studying S points on S1, if you like, maps from S to S1. Um, so the, the, what makes this go is that S1 is a contractible space uh, modulo Z, so in sort of homotopy land we would just say it's a point mod G, mod, mod Z. And so for us, what is this BG going to be? Um, so now I'll sort of back to doing algebraic geometry. So for us, BG is nothing but a point modulo the action of the finite group G acting trivially. So I mean, there are, and, but of course, this quotient, um, it seems a little funny if you're not used to it, but I mean, uh, in usual algebraic geometry, we just say, well, the quotient by a trivial action is just the thing itself. But as an algebraic stack, that's certainly not true. It's kind of its own thing. And indeed, um, the sort of fundamental picture here is that if I have any scheme S and it maps to BG, BG has an atile G cover by just a point, and I can pull this back to get a G cover of S. Um, and in particular, if S is spec K, then I can pull this, then this is an atal uh, G cover of K, which is just a G extension of K. So to sum up, um, say again? 
So these covers are not necessarily connected. So you can count. So yes, and that's, that actually will become important. Probably not in what I'm going to say in this hour, but like it does become important. Um, right, so I mean the G cover not in the sense of a connected G cover. So you're right, it's something more general. We should call it like a G eta algebra is really like what it is on the algebraic side. Um, so that's secretly what I mean, yeah. So, so to sum up, if K is my global field, the K points of this stack are equal to the set of, um, maybe I'll even write what you told me to say, Matt, G eta algebras um, over K, but really sort of you're not far off if you just think of this as like Galois G extensions of K. And now this is great because now it seems like we've said, aha, perfect, like indeed, these two counting problems are species of the same problem. In both cases, I'm trying to just count rational points on something, which maybe is not quite a variety, but it's like the next best thing, an algebraic stack. Um, but now we encounter a more serious problem, which is that if we count, we have to count in a certain order. We need to get a finite number, which means we need to bound the height. And now, when we say this, we have to understand what do we mean by counting points of BG of bounded height. And that's really the meat of what I want to explain today, like how one can make sense of this. Because I think in the end, it was very psychologically confusing, but I think, we've, I think it now makes sense. And I'll try to convince you guys of, of the same. So, um, so, we simply want to do what you might call Batira Manin for BG. Oh, so what do I, oh, I, so I have to pull this one down and then the other one up, is that right? Oh no, that one's just gone, okay. <laughs> I'm just going to go over here. Um, um, so we should do Batira Bani. Um, and count points, um, rational points on BG of bounded height. Now we face the fundamental problem, but What does this mean? And of course, sort of somehow, in the spirit of our discussions yesterday about, you know, what are we allowed to say, maybe really the question is, what should this mean? I mean, there is the definition we have to make one. Um, I mean, I'll emphasize the right, what we're so used to doing is just saying like, well, okay, we just like use the height from projective space. But I mean, BG is not a closed subscheme of projective space because if it were, it would be a scheme. And it's not. So in this more general context, um, we don't have the ability to use our usual definition. Yeah, Matt? I'm going to ask, even if you can define height, is it really going to be the same as true? I mean, that's going to be another. No, I mean, that's a desideratum of our definition, right? So, um, so I secretly, of course, I have to pretend I don't know what I want to get, but secretly I do know what I want to get. But fortunately, I get that. So and you have to define it in a way that makes it look like you could have come up with this definition without being motivated by getting the discriminant, um, which hopefully I'll succeed in doing. Okay. Um, so um, in order to describe this definition, let me actually start now by, because it's a little bit easier to describe if I think about the case um, where k is just, let's say, the function field of a curve, in, fact, in, in particular a rational function field, okay? Um, so, so what is the height of a KT point on some variety? Um, 
I'm going to inevitably start calling my varieties x, so sorry for using that and using it as the bound of height before, but that's what I'm going to do. Um, well, um, we know that x corresponds to a map from, I mean, this, I can think of this as a field, or I can think of it as a function field of a p1, and so a kt point on x, so x, remember this is in x of k of t, it corresponds to a map from p1 to x. Now, we come to an important point. Before I told you that when I was talking about the height of a, of a variety, I had a projective variety. Well, another way of saying that is that I chose an ample line bundle on my variety. In this case, it was, uh, that's just the O of 1 from projective space. So, in this abstract setting, I had better give myself um, an ample line bundle, or really any line bundle, L on X. So I'll remind you that that's here. And now, in this context, what the height is, is like really simple. Namely, um, X is some map, which I'll also call X. And then I can pull this line bundle, whatever it is, back to my P1. Now I have a line bundle on P1. A line bundle on P1 has a degree, and that's the height. So it's a very nice geometric thing. Um, so a deg of P1, x star L, is the height of x. And I, really, every picture I'm going to draw in this talk is going to be in this uh, function field case. But if you really want it to be over Q, uh, you should feel free to kind of quietly mumble the word metrized every time I say line bundle or right before. and then mumble the word arakelov, like right before I'm going to say degree, and then you'll be saying something that's roughly correct. Um, but it's, it's easier to sort of say what's going on uh, in this geometric case. OK, so this seems like a pretty simple definition that we should just try to extend to the case where instead of x, I have some stack geeks. So let's try to do it, and we'll just see everything go to hell immediately. OK. Um, so. So let's extend this definition, or let's try um, to a stack. And let's say, I mean, let's say this is, I mean, let's say this is a proper smooth Lee Mumford stack. Um, I, I, it, we can do it for those things I don't want to say, so I want to say Lee Mumford. Is that okay? Okay. Um, so, um, so again, let's let x be a point on this stack over the field k of t. So I'm going to be a little bit more careful in what I write now. So in other words, I have a map from spec k of t um, to this stack. And let me say something sad, which is that already we're kind of dead at step 0. Because what I did, we're so used to doing it that I didn't even comment that I was doing it, is um, I said over there, I never, I never sort of wrote spec k of t. I'm just like, OK, so you have a rational point over the function field, so you have a map from p1 to x. And what I was using there is the evaluative criterion of properness. That if I have a proper scheme, and I have a map from the function field of a curve to that scheme, then it extends to a map of the whole curve. And the sad fact of life is the evaluative prop criterion of properness in that form does not hold for stacks. And you can sort of see that somehow that can't happen. You might really like it. I mean, let's say, for instance, that this x were b of z mod 2z. In some sense, like all of the, a lot of what's going on here, you can tell just from this very simple example, the classifying stack of a group of order 2. OK, so if I have a map from spec of k of t to that, then that's a quadratic extension, right? I mean, this, this would be a z mod 2z cover. So this corresponds to a quadratic extension of k of t. Well, if I can extend that to a map from p1, let's sort of pretend for a moment I can do this. This would be an etal z mod 2z cover of p1. But p1 doesn't have etal covers, or rather, to that point, it only has the disconnected one. So it certainly doesn't have the one whose generic point is the quadratic extension you want. Um, 
the quadratic extension you want is somehow the function field of some hyperelliptic curve, which corresponds to a double cover of u1 that is not a tall, that is branched. So you might think at this point already, like, what the hell am I going to do? OK. So it turns out, and this is one of the things uh, that's in the paper, that you can't quite extend this map to a map from p1 to this that x. But what you can't do is extend it to a map from something I'm going to call script C, uh, which we call in the paper the tuning stack, um, where C is a stacky curve. So by that, I just mean it's an algebraic stack, which is generically the same as P1. So it's just like a one-dimensional, nice, smooth thing. But, um, but it has some points on it that are stacky. So you used to draw pictures like this, Barry, when you would talk about these magnified curves. Um, the picture you should imagine is, in a case like this, let's say I was um, studying the quadratic extension of k of t, uh, which corresponded to some, I don't know, some hyperelliptic curve of genus g. So there's like supposed to be two g plus two branch points. Well, what you can extend this to is a map from some kind of curve, which it looks a lot like p1 to the naked eye, but actually there's two g plus two points where this little thing I'm drawing here is actually only half of a point. And that's the way these stacky curves look. I guess I shouldn't have drawn an odd number of them, huh? Maybe I should put on one more, okay, to make that realistic. And then, you know, this funny curve with a bunch of half points, this is indeed covered by a genus 2 hyperelliptic curve, and that is an atoll cover, because what looked like a ramification point is actually an atoll cover of a half point. So that's kind of like the yoga of stacky curves. Okay, so this seems promising, right? We have, uh, we've, we've, we've gotten over the first barrier, which is that we actually have a curve mapping to our stack, which we can pull back to. Okay. Oh, and of course, we also better have a line bundle. We're going to compute height. We've got to have a line bundle on our thing. So, ready? We've got our line bundle. This I'm still going to call x. Let me call this extension x bar. I'm going to give it a new name now that there's actually some content to it. And so, it seems like completely obvious what you should do. Um, well, namely, at this point, you may say, so idea, um, define the height of x to be the degree on this stack C of the pullback of the line bundle. And you just got to believe me that you know, on a stack curve, there's still a notion of a divisor, there's still a notion of degree of a divisor. Everything is good. Um, so for instance, we could do that for this case here and see what we get. And some of this definition is so simple that this clearly has all the properties uh, you want height to have, and you can sort of try it in this example. And everything about this definition is great, except that it's identically zero. <laughs> so it has all the conditions that you want, but it's just not the right thing. So, so problem with this definition um, when e.g. x equals b of z mod 2z, always the test case you want to have in mind, this does not give the discriminant of the extension, it gives zero. Um, what is that? It's sort of for a very simple reason. Um, you guys all just let me casually write down that line bundle on that stack because if you either know what a line bundle on a stack is or you were like intimidated away from asking like what the hell is a line bundle on a stack, okay, I'll tell you, at least in the case of classifying a stack of a finite group. Um, so a line bundle on BG is a character of G, a one-dimensional representation. Okay, so I didn't tell you which line bundle I want to use. Let's posit that I don't want to use the trivial line bundle. And if G is Z mod 2Z, there's only one other one-dimensional representation, right? The non-trivial one. So, um, so for B of Z mod 2Z, we may take L to be uh, the non-trivial
representation. Um, but then here's the issue. Um, the issue is that that representation tensor with itself is the trivial representation. If you like, the Picard group of BG is just the abelianization of G, which is a torsion group. Um, so, but L plus L equals zero. So what that means is that whatever this number is, um, if I double it, I get zero. Okay, so here we face a difficult choice. <laughs> You could declare that you're going to try to make some kind of definition of height with torsion coefficients. I refuse to do that. That just feels wrong. Height should be a real number. But then you have this problem that you sort of, that this is apparently a zero. So the question is what to do about this. And now I think I can basically tell you what the actual uh, definition is of height with respect to this line bundle. Um, so, yeah, so. Um, so twice this degree is uh, is the degree of the pullback of 2L, which is zero, and that's uh, not so good. So instead, um, I'm going to write that as a definition that might at first seem a little bit ad hoc, and then I'm going to try to convince you that it's right. So instead, define height of x, okay, I gotta put one more uh, di map in my diagram. So here I have this stacky curve, it has a generic point, but also a stacky curve has what's called a coarse moduli map. So everybody who studies elliptic curves knows this very well, right? There's sort of x of 1, the moduli stack of elliptic curves, but there's also the j line, which is an authentic p1 that that moduli space maps to. And we all the time try to like, describe an elliptic curve by its j invariant. We know there's like all kinds of technical nastiness that comes from the fact that that's not really the moduli space, it's the coarse moduli space, and we just kind of grit our teeth and deal with it. That's what we're going to do now. Okay, ready? So this thing maps to some p1 by a, a coarse moduli, moduli map pi, and the definition of height is that we take L, we pull it back by x bar star to get a line bundle on this stacky curve C, and then we push forward to get a line bundle on an authentic P1, and then we take that um, degree. And of course, I should say that had I started with the function field of some other curve, that other curve would be here. So this definition is not restricted to P1. I'm just this is like the easiest case to describe. So. Let me say a few things about. What is that? What is that push for? So let's let's draw a picture of it. So here's the. It's, it's, David taught me how to do this. It's very fun. It's, it's not a line. Yeah. It is. So what you're thinking, I think, I'm going to try to go into Mark's mind. You're going to say like, wait a minute, if I have like some degree R map, like a push forward with a line bundle, it's going to turn into like a rank R vector bundle. Yeah. But <laughs> this map is degree one. Yeah, but what about the second? I mean, it's still a degree one. It's a degree one map that's not an isomorphism. If you like, it's a birational map because it's, it's, it's an isomorphism in the generic point. So it does, in fact, take line bundles to line bundles. But it's spinning the inner sketch by some like resaturation of those attachments. Like modification of those attachments. Yeah. Well, I can tell you exactly what kind of thing happens, right? So if I, um, so if I have a line bundle on here, let's say it's like. I can think of it as represented by a divisor, and that divisor is going to have, it's going to look just like we're used to at the non stacky points. It's going to have some pluses and minuses of points. But then at these half points, it's allowed to have a one half. It's allowed to be a half integer if it wants to. And roughly speaking, what happens is um, pushing forward a divisor from C to its coarse moduli space P1 sends the sum of Ni Pi to the sum of floor Ni uh, Pi of Pi. So it actually does something to the degree. Yeah, exactly. So what is it? So exactly, it does exactly the right thing. But here, you want to get, I mean, you want to get some number that keeps track of how much ramification there is. Um, this pullback line bundle, actually, you get something that has degree zero here. But when you push forward, you end up losing one half for each of these two g plus two points. So you lose a g plus one. So you basically are keeping track of that 
uh, discriminant. Okay, so. Um, no, it's not. And that is, in some sense, our difficulties with this were, in some sense, very psychological because exactly what Evan has pointed out, it's really disgusting, right? I mean, we are used to the very height machine, and we're used to almost like a physical law of life that the height with respect to two, the height with respect to L1 plus L2 is the height with respect to L1 plus the height with respect to L2. Um, it's very hard to let go of that, but if you don't, you're completely screwed because the argument I just gave shows you that there is no non-zero height for a torsion line bundle that respects that. So either you just have to define something that's identically zero, or you have to give up additivity. We made the latter choice. I think it's the right choice. Okay, so, so, so absolutely, push forward is not like a linear thing to do. It's not a homomorphism. Um, so, so, so warning. So as, am I still in the shadow down here? No. Okay. So warning, as Evan pointed out, um, it is no longer the case, what we're so used to, that the height with respect to L1 plus the height with respect to L2 is the same thing as the height with respect to L1 plus L2. But as I say, that's unavoidable if you want to get a non-trivial theory. Um, OK. Um, so, torsion thing, I mean, that can make problems go away by taking powers of it, but as you say, that makes the problems go away by setting everything equal to zero. No, I mean, you don't like literally just take that. There's a little sequence, you've got to like take some of the sequence, but there's just bouncing around to the average. Okay, so I'll say this. What I'm going to say in a second is that, so first of all, one issue is that we don't want to do this just for line bundles. We want to do it for vector bundles. And there it's a little harder to see what to do. I mean, there's sort of tricks that help you for line bundles, like taking them with high powers, which is not so clear. So maybe I'll say that and then see if, I mean, so. Can you give an example of a, of a point for the height in your sense? Just give a, give a numerical example. OK, so um, yes, let's. Uh, Okay, let's see if I, um, I'm buying some time. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So, let, so let's, try, let's, try to, let's try to give this example that I just wrote down over there, okay? Let's try to take, um, let's try to take, uh, so, um, the quadratic extension, K of T, a join root, um, I don't know, x to the 6 minus 1. Um, right? So this is a good quadratic extension of k of t corresponding to a genus 2 curve. Um, and now, fortunately, I've already drawn the picture. Mm -hmm. It's over there. But I have to tell you uh, what happens uh, with this line. All right, so maybe, maybe I'll draw it again so it's, it's right by here. So here your c is going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 half points. Um, this thing maps to b mod of z mod 2z, and over this, I'm going to consider the line bundle, which corresponds to the non-trivial representation. Um, and when I pull back, what am I going to get? Say again. Oh, um, whatever we want this variable to be. What did I call it before? I thought I called it t. Oh yeah, this they're both t. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. When I pull this line bundle back, um, I'm going to get something I know has degree of zero, but you can also check that it's sort of, it's uh, what multiplicity it has at each of these branch points. It actually is not an integer, it's a half integer. I mean, when you look at linearly equivalent divisors on a stack, it's just like 
P1 usually is you can sort of move integral amounts of point from one place to another. But if you're one half, you can maybe make it three half by taking one from someplace else, or negative one half, but you can't ever put it into z. So in fact, what this divisor is going to look like is it's going to be linearly equivalent to a half of each of these points, and then you know somewhere over here, a minus three, or maybe a three different point. It doesn't matter which ones. And then when we push forward um, to P1, you floor all these numbers, and you get, yes, thank you for making me do this, Barry. OK. These, these halves all become 0, and you get negative 3. OK, so this is why, after we'd written the entire paper, we realized we had to go back and be like, oh, yeah, a better thing would be to say it's like negative of what we said it was, and you get positive numbers. It's actually, if you define it like this, it's, you get negative numbers rather than positive, as you might be cosmetically more appealing. Um, No, because you sort of dualize the line bundle, do this, and then take negative of the degree that you get. Yes, we also went, we went through this exact same uh, <laughs> series of changing the signs until it gave the right answer in all cases. Um, so yes, so that, that's what you have to, all right, I'm even going to write it, right? It's, uh, where is it? It's, it's negative, there we go, that's the actual definition. In the case of a scheme, it agrees, those negative signs cancel each other out. Um, OK, but now I'm very near the end of the my time. So in two minutes, I'll give my pitch for vector bundles, which is that we're so used to sort of saying height is a property of a line bundle on a stack. But if I had not done b z mod 2 z and instead done what about the classifying stack of, let's say, the symmetric group on d letters, well, what line bundle is an interesting one with which to compute the height. And the problem is there's not that many interesting line bundles on the symmetric group on D letters, because the symmetric group on D letters does not have a very interesting one-dimensional representation theory. All it has is the, the sign character. And the sign character is certainly not telling you everything you need to know about, uh, about an SD extension. It's only telling you its quadratic subfield. So in fact, the, so to get this right, you need to compute height with respect to a vector bundle B on SD, in which case the height of x is defined to be um, negative, it's defined in the exact same way, it's negative degree of pi lower star x bar upper star of V dual. But now this thing is like some rank R vector bundle on the base. Um, well, I haven't told you. I'm, I'm saying this is the definition of height with respect to a vector bundle. And now I'll tell you which representation I want. So I'll just comment that we could have done this for a scheme, but it would have been a silly thing to do because this is just really the degree of the top wedge product of V. And I could have just done that to V in the first place and used L. But because of the nonlinearity of pi star, I can't do that here. I actually get a different answer than if I'd started then. The wedge product can't cross this. So this is like actually now a new thing. Um, OK, so to conclude, I'll just say that, um, so if the stack is B of SD, or some subgroup of SD, and V is so a vector bundle on B of a finite group is just a representation of that group, and you just take the permutation rep. Then you can compute that the height with respect to B of X is the discriminant of the corresponding <coughs> degree D extension. Of course, you could, as Dick points out, there's lots of representations of the symmetric group, many more than when it's just Z 2z. And actually, one thing that's cool is there, it's sort of been understood by number field counting people that there are lots of different invariants that are like the discriminant with respect to which you can count number fields. And from this point of view, this is just a matter of choosing different vector bundles on B of SD. And I think in some sense, this is like a guide to sort of which counts are interesting ones. So I'm at the end of my time, so I'll just say um, 
This is the definition when you go through different situations in which you want to study rational points on a stack, like for instance the moduli stack of elliptic curves or something like that. It seems that in every case this definition with an appropriate vector bundle, um, in, in almost all these definitions people already have some sense of what they mean by the size of a rational point on that stack, um, and it seems to me that by large we sort of recover them all. Like somehow like people were already right about what they meant by the size or complexity of a point on these stacks, but this uh, gives you sort of a way of thinking of these all in a relatively clean, uh, uniform definition, which I think is the right one. Okay, so I'll stop there. Thank you guys so much.